Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning on the 16th of February. Uh, this is our OBFIT webinars, one in the series that we are currently conducting. And it is on an exciting subject, genetics and its relationship with obesity. The study of genetics in itself is a recent event in medical science. To the best of my knowledge, we have about 25 or 50,000 odd genes in the human body, but recent, and these genes control the entire human function in many different ways. But recent reading specific to this webinar has informed me that there are 250 genes in the human body that are specifically related to obesity. So understand this. We have say 25,000 genes and about 250 of these are specifically related to obesity. Now, my limited understanding is that of the two types of genes, monogenic and polygenic, the monogenic genes being individual genes, five to six of these genes are directly related to obesity. And Dr. Nikat can, of course, correct me uh, in her presentation. And these are largely genetically connected uh, and difficult to manage, but I do believe that there is medication and other such things uh, that make this somewhat manageable. But the good news is that 95% or 245 out of the 250 genes that are connected with obesity, 95% are polygenic and by epigenic reversal, you can actually control these genes. And as a consequence, you can manage your obesity. So I'll put it to you like this, that genetics is not the final word when it comes to obesity. It is the starting point at which we realize what our problems are and how we can manage it. But in keeping with the general genre of our entire weight loss program, in which this year we have 18,000 participants, the weight loss challenge, epigenetics or the polygenic reversal of obesity is largely controlled by lifestyle. The way we live, the food we eat, the exercise that we do, our physical activity, our sleep, all of these things reversely control our genes. While our genes control us, we can control our genes by the way we live. Now, I am confused and I'm sure you are confused and I perhaps have confused you even more. The other bit of information that I want to share is that 70% of obese individuals have a genetic correlation, which means that weight loss is clearly a subject of genetics and we must start it is important for us to consider genetic evaluation. And in this, I have good news. Indus Health, of which our speaker today, Dr. Nikhat Khan, is a part. Indus Health is a sponsor of the Weight Loss Challenge. And they have very kindly, very kindly offered to evaluate all the winners genetically, which means that all the participants, the top 20 winners 
of this weight loss challenge will all be genetically evaluated by a sputum test. And this is very interesting, very interesting. And of course, for the rest of us who may not succeed as well as the 20, there is always the probability and the possibility of learning from this and undergoing genetic testing as a first step. But ladies and gentlemen, I, I am remiss in confusing you and I will not confuse you any further. I will hand over to Dr. Nikhat Nahid Khan. Now, Dr. Khan, as I have read, has done her PhD in life sciences with a specialization, her B.Tech and M.Tech is all in biotechnology. Now, she has done a PhD in life sciences from Tata Memorial and is a research scientist in genetics. She is a genomic professional and years of experience in genetic testing, genotyping, genodata curation, genetic counseling, and so on and so forth. I can see that Dr. Khan has several publications and several honors from several institutions due to her study. She speaks English, Hindi, Marathi, Urdu, and even offered to conduct this webinar in Arabic. But I requested that we should, in this instance, do it in English. So ladies and gentlemen, my great pleasure to present Dr. Nikhat Khan. Thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy. That was a very nice introduction. Thank you so much for your kind words and such a lovely introduction. A very good morning to everyone. So let me know when we can start. We can start right away, Dr. Nika. Okay, great. Uh, Doc, is it possible to switch on your camera, please? Only for a recording purpose. Yeah, sure. Uh, is it fine? Perfect. Okay. So please confirm uh, if you are able to see my screen. Yeah, we're able to see your slides. We're on slide 32. Okay. Yes. Just a moment. Okay. So a very uh, good morning to everyone. So here today, uh, as Dr. Uh, Kennedy just explained to you that we are going to talk about a very interesting prospect or the aspect of obesity and the associated weight loss journey that how genetics is an interesting science which apart from controlling various other, almost all the traits in the human body are being controlled by your genes. And your weight is no exception. Multiple parameters related to weight regulation is associated with genetic factors. And in this uh, presentation, we will touch upon the things that how different genes can control the various aspects of weight regulation, how it predisposes to obesity, and uh, how it is not the end as very rightly said by Dr. Kennedy that it is just the beginning. So knowing the genetic predisposition is just the beginning and using this information can help you in your weight loss journey. As we move ahead in the presentation, we will see that how it can be done. So to start with, uh, just a moment. Uh, just a moment. Uh, there is some technical this thing. I will have no see. issue, Doctor Nikhil. You can take time. No issue. No, no. Uh, I think the wrong presentation got. Okay. Wait. That old presentation is getting changed. Oh, 
Uh, I am very sorry for that. Actually, a wrong presentation got uploaded. So, uh, as I was telling you that in this uh, presentation, we will begin with uh, that how genetics can help you in uh, your weight loss journey. So, to begin with, as you all know that obesity by definition is known as excess of body weight which results from accumulation of body fat over time either due to excess of energy intake or due to lack of energy expenditure and if we go by the definition from world health organization obesity is actually defined as an abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that have a tendency to impair health now, whenever the body mass index, which is the indicator of obesity or a way to measure obesity, when BMI crosses 30 uh, kg per meter square, we define it as obesity. Something between 24.9 to 29.9 is called as overweight and uh, the normal range being 18.5 to 24.9. So, no, can you, uh, sorry, uh, can you put it in the slideshow, please? Are you not able, because I have... No, no, we can see the slide. Uh, it's only the first slide, uh, I think the second slide. Okay, let me check. Here it's moving, but in our screen... Doc, you can unshare and uh, reshare again. Yeah, it's coming now. Uh, are the slides changing now? Perfect. Yep. Okay. So... Okay, so as you can see in this slide that uh, body mass index, it is an indicator of obesity and whenever the BMI is between 18.5 to 24.9, it is considered as a normal BMI. Anything between 25 to 29.9 is overweight and anything above 30 kg per meter square is considered as obesity and whenever it crosses uh, 35, it is called as extreme or morbid obesity. So now if you see in this graph of the world map, you see the prevalence is different across different continents of the world. But one thing is that is very common is that it has impacted nearly all parts of the world. And there is an escalating global increase in obesity, which is why this term called as globesity was coined. So when we look at the prevalence, 
we uh, when we look at the prevalence we see that in the last four decades between 1975 to 2015 we have only seen an upward trend in the prevalence of obesity across all age groups okay so which means that obesity as a problem is only increasing it has not i mean despite being recognized as a global public health concern and taking so many steps the trend is in the increasing mode only it is not going down in any of the part of the world so we can clearly say that weight of the world is rapidly changing and which is why in 1997 who declared obesity as a global epidemic now when we go by the estimates for the global levels of overweight and obesity we suggest the reports they suggest that 4 billion people may be affected by the year 2035 and nearly half of the world population will be affected by obesity when we go with the prevalence of only obesity not considering a combination of both overweight and obesity we are anticipating an increase in like from 14 percent to it is going to be 24 percent this means a quarter of the world population is going to be affected and it includes all adults children and adolescents when we look at the figures which is taken from the world obesity at least 2023 and we look into the prevalence uh, at the ua level we the projected trends also show that it is going to increase and 45% of the adults will have obesity, which is very high. And it has also uh, calculated other uh, increase or trends. And if you say that in adult obesity, there is going to be 1.9% annual increase in obesity. And in childhood obesity, it is going to be 2.7% high, which all these figures, they are very alarming. And it reiterates the fact that it is actually a problem worth considering and taking active steps. So uh, I would like to take a moment to appreciate Rack Hospital over here for their sincere efforts into recognizing this as a problem and taking initiatives and steps to mend this problem and to uh, take certain initiatives which are very important at the public health level. So their work is commendable and I would like to appreciate their work. And the way that they are trying to create awareness around the uh, topic and educate people that why it is important to talk about obesity and to take steps to tackle this problem is really commendable. Now, when we see that obesity is not a, not a standalone problem, it is not a disease in itself. It is actually a gateway to multiple diseases. A person who is obese, they are very, they are at a very high risk of contracting other uh, problems like type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia. It also increases risk of certain cancers, hypertension, other heart diseases. And uh, as far as my knowledge goes, nearly 258 different health conditions risk increases with obesity so you can see that it is not a problem in itself it 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 invites a myriad of health problems which is why it becomes all the more important to tackle it now obesity is also not uh, not only that it is it has multiple uh, consequences it also has multiple uh, reasons or multiple causes behind it. It is a multifactorial disorders, right from your genetics to aging to other comorbid conditions to stress. There are multiple factors that may uh, increase your risk for obesity. Now, when we look into the genetic factors related to obesity, we all know that human body is controlled uh, to a very large extent by the blueprint of life, which is the DNA. So there are a set of genes which is associated with different functions in the body. Similarly, there are certain genes that are associated with managing or regulation of energy inside the body and weight. And uh, they gen there are certain genetic variations which are small differences at the DNA sequence level between individuals or populations. 
that may modify the effect of what we eat that is the dietary intake how that food will be metabolized in the body whether a person will be more sensitive to certain kind of food or it will be intolerant to certain kind of food what food preference will be there whether someone will like more of a sweet taste or more of a bitter taste or a fat perception is higher all those things put together controlled by different genes may have an impact on your overall weight so there are certain genes that interact with your environmental factors and when we consider genetic predisposition to obesity is actually manifest through the gene environment interactions which underlie the pathophysiology of obesity so genetically at genetic level when we see very broadly uh, the genetic forms of obesity are characterized into or briefly classified into syndromic and non syndromic forms and uh, whenever a large chromosomal uh, rearrangement is associated or when obesity manifests as one of the manifestation of a syndrome that is associated with mental retardation and other developmental disorders then it is categorized as a syndromic form so when we talk about the non syndromic forms of obesity as dr kennedy just explained in his uh, introduction that there are two major forms first of all one is monogenic obesity which are the rare forms of obesity which is characterized by mutations in single gene and then there comes a polygenic obesity which is the more common version of obesity and it is multifactorial in nature which means that the uh, when when we have to distinguish between these two forms i have to put it in this way that in monogenic obesity the the mutation or the variation lies in one single gene but the effect is very large in itself it is able to cause that particular disease but when we talk about polygenic forms of any disease including obesity this means that each genetic variation will exhibit small small effects and multiple genetic variations come together will produce a large effect to manifest that particular disease so here not only the genetic variations these genetic variations also interact with the environmental factors which may be physical factors or chemical factors or other biological factors when all of these interact with the genetic variations put together and multiple genetic variations here i am saying then it leads to the polygenic obesity and here if you see monogenic obesity is rare whereas polygenic obesity is more common in the population which is where as dr kennedy was saying that it gives us a scope for intervention in the rare forms of obesity there is very less scope of intervention but in the rare forms it is preventable it is reversible by the epigenetic alterations by mending our lifestyle we can change it so the good news is that the more common form of obesity is actually preventable and reversible so as i was saying that genes control your or regulate your weight at multiple levels there are certain genes which are associated with appetite and satiety some people because of certain genetic variations they may have low satiety i mean even if they take a large portion of food they will not feel satiated and which is why they will have a tendency to take more food or the portion will be higher which can contribute to obesity similarly appetite regulation is also under genetic control then eating behavior whether someone is having a binge eating or emotional eating or stress eating tendency is also controlled in part by genetics then there are various hormones that are functional in our body that has a lot to do with your weight like leptin and ghrelin all these so the there are genetic factors that controls that how efficiently these hormones will work inside the body and accordingly there will be an impact on weight more importantly uh, if you see that nutrient metabolism nutrient processing whether someone is more sensitive to carbohydrate or fats or proteins how that nutrient will be metabolized in the body and how the energy will be 
uh, energy expenditure is going to be inside that person's body is largely under genetic control. Like suppose if someone is having a genotype or a genetic variant or a copy of a gene which is associated with less fat deposition and more energy expenditure, then they have a tendency to have a normal weight. However, if someone is inherited a copy of a gene or a genetic variant that is favoring fat deposition and that is uh, conserving the energy and not uh, the energy expenditure is not much. In that case, what happens is that that person will tend to gain weight and it will contribute to obesity. So thus you see that the, the role of genetics in weight regulation is at multiple levels, not at one level, which is why it is important that through some mechanism, we come to know that what is my genetic makeup actually and what are my genetic tendencies and what are the areas where I can make some improvement to take a charge on my weight loss uh, journey. So if I have to summarize so far, we have seen that obesity continues to be a major public health concern, which is a chronic and complex disease, which has a very high heritability. When I say that high heritability means the variation that you see in, see in uh, BMI across individuals in a particular population, 70% of that is because of genetic factors. This means it is largely controlled by your genes. It is multifactorial in etiology and multiple, multivariable in manifestation. But the good news is that obesity is very much preventable and very much reversible. You just have to know that where your effort should be focused on, where the target is, I mean, what is the exact reason that is contributing to your weight gain? And you can pinpoint that and work on that aspect and weight loss will be much easier. So before talking about weight loss, we have to see that weight is, has a lot to do with energy balance. So whenever there is an optimal energy balance, this means when the energy intake is more or less equal to energy expenditure, in that case, the metabolic status is optimal and you have a tendency to have a normal body weight. However, when this energy balance is altered in a positive direction. This means the energy intake. There is a positive energy balance in which energy intake is much higher than the energy expenditure. In that case, there is going to be metabolic disorders and you may have a tendency to become overweight and eventually obesity may click in. Now, when we talk about weight loss, we have to work around this energy balance only wherein we have to go into calorie deficit and create a situation of negative energy balance. Wherein the energy expenditure has to be much higher than the energy intake so that there is calorie deficit and you can achieve uh, weight loss. Now this can be done at multiple levels. I mean, actually weight loss is not one single component. It is an integration of multi-component continuum of care, which includes dietary interventions, lifestyle modifications. In certain cases, help of medications is to be taken. And in very extreme conditions where uh, in, in certain people where there is severe obesity or comorbid conditions, they have to go for certain, uh, certain surgical interventions like bariatric surgery or other forms of surgery. So you see that at the end of the pyramid is dietary intervention and it is consuming the largest uh, portion in the pyramid because that is the most relevant or the most basic level at which weight loss can be targeted because you have to like weight loss can be achieved by modifying dietary intakes both at the quantity level. I mean the portion control is to be done and when I talk about the quality of food, this means you have to identify that which macronutrient is actually contributing. The macronutrient that we're talking about is the carbs, the fats, the protein, the fiber, the MUFA and PUFA, other forms of uh, unsaturated fats. So which of these food component is actually contributing to my weight gain? And accordingly, I can modify my diet 
so the quality of food plate that I'm taking in can be altered so that I can achieve the weight loss that is desired. Now, in other lifestyle modifications, apart from the dietary intervention, it requires decreasing the sedentary behavior, increasing the level of physical activity, and decreasing the influence of various other contributing factors like behavioral factors. Uh, as I told you that behavioral factors like low satiety and binge eating and snacking, emotional eating, all these factors. And when I talk about social factors, there are a lot of social factors that influence that what we put inside our body. So we it, it goes to the TV commercials, the availability of the calorie dense foods or the trends in uh, current trends in the society like this cola and all these things. Earlier on, it was not there. So there has been a steep increase uh, in the consumption of these unhealthy foods and the social factors have a lot to do with it. So we have to decrease the influence of all these things and bring in a lifestyle modification uh, to achieve weight loss. So for certain set of people where obesity, uh, like with obesity who do not respond as well to the dietary and lifestyle modification in such people, medications may be required and same goes for surgery. Now, when we talk about the biggest myth related to weight loss is that there is a one size fit all approach to weight loss. However, this is not true. So you must have heard that there are two or three people with the same level of obesity, maybe doing the same level of physical activity, having the same diet plan. But out of that, one person is showing the desired results. However, in the other two, there is exactly no change or not the expected result is seen because all of us are designed differently from inside. We all are different at the genetic level. The contributing factors therefore are different and which is why the one diet or one approach is not going to be suitable for all of us and which is why the level of or the angle of personalization or customization comes in. So now weight loss journey, how can genetic testing help? As I was saying that individualized or personalized weight management recommendations, which is based on one individual's genetic profile, it can create a more targeted, feasible and a sustainable plan that can be uh, taken up for a long period of time and because the fat diets and all those things that we see that that works for a certain period of time, you lose weight also, but then there is always a tendency of weight regain. When you stop doing that particular approach or that particular diet, the weight comes back. So our target should always be that we have to work on a plan that is very feasible and sustainable on a long run so that when you have lost that desired level of weight you maintain that weight okay and genetic testing can help you because once you understand the genetic makeup you can actually pinpoint that what are the areas of improvement where there is a scope for improvement you can come up with a better diet plan more effective exercise program there can be better clarity on what is actually deterring weight loss and there will be, by going through your DNA test results, there can be certain level of improved motivation that can drive you to work harder for your weight loss. So basically the genes that are associated are, asso are associated with the metabolism, appetite regulation, nutrient processing, and even that whether you are going to respond well to a particular diet, type of diet, or exercise is also regulated by your genes. So it is very important that first, before embarking on this journey of weight loss, you first understand what are your inherent strength and limitations of your body based obviously on your genetic profile so that you can work on the weaknesses and you can tap on the potentials. And this can enhance your journey of weight loss. Now, I was saying that by some mechanism, you have to understand that what is your genetic predisposition or your genetic tendency. So what is that mechanism? What is that tool? That tool is genetic test or genomic test. 
So there are different kind of genomic test that is available. So one such test is called as predictive genomic test, wherein by, by studying your particular genes through your, we extract your DNA and then we study specific positions in your entire genome, which is associated with certain parameters. And after studying that, the researchers or the scientists, they can develop a report for you, which will uh, highlight that what are your potential health risks and predisposition, what are your genetic tendencies for nutrition related parameters, for fitness related parameters, for certain habits and for certain health conditions. Now what happens uh, when you understand about your genetic risk? By learning about your potential health risk, including obesity and predisposition, you can take steps to prevent or to delay the onset of certain health conditions and make more informed choices about the food that you want to eat, the test that you want to go for, the monitoring that you want to do with an overall goal for improved health and wellness. So as you can see, your overall health is a combination of your genetics, which is there, which is fixed at the time of your conception. So you cannot really change your genetics, but you can always change your lifestyle and change the overall health outcomes. So if someone is having a genetic risk for a particular condition, like suppose if you have a genetic risk for obesity, but because it is a combination of your genetics and lifestyle, if you improve your lifestyle, lifestyle, you can actually decrease the effect of that genetic risk through improved lifestyle, more regular health screening and taking more prophylactic measures in case it is required. So this is how obesity can be prevented. And in someone who is already obese and already having, it can help in weight loss and management of that particular condition. So now a preventive a genomics test has a very uh, important component which is called as nutrigenetic testing. It is a field of science which involves studying that which genes or which genetic variants are associated with different parameters associated to nutrition and fitness. And accordingly, uh, based on the knowledge which is available worldwide, a uh, database is created and then your genetic makeup is checked and mapped against this that what type of genotype you carry and accordingly what are your risks and what can be done. So the benefits of nutrigenetic testing is that it can help you to prevent certain lifestyle diseases because maybe some, someone is obese right now, but they may also have genetic risk for other health conditions. So it is like it is a very comprehensive approach. It is not like it is focusing on one disease at a time. In the same test, you can look for a multiple number of diseases so you can focus on your weight loss as well uh, other uh, health conditions for which you have a genetic risk and you can manage that as well all together you can take a more holistic approach towards health along with your weight loss you can eat as per your body's unique tendencies that's what's best for your body what macronutrients are increasing the risk or you have a weight loss tendency with which particular macronutrient accordingly you can optimize your nutrient intake so as to have an optimal weight and to avoid any kind of deficiencies of vitamins and minerals it can enhance your digestive health and maximize sports performance now when we see that uh, weight loss approaches as i say that one size does not fit all so over the years with so many studies uh, taking place on this subject, we have seen that there has been a paradigm shift in weight loss strategy. Now, people are moving away from generic diet. I mean, one, one particular diet that may be suitable for all. They are moving away from this approach and going towards the genetic diet plan. Because if you see, because which is more personalized and more customized as per one genetic profile. Because if you see, Weight loss is actually the real struggle for some people, even though they have the, all the willpower, they are taking all the necessary steps, but they are not getting the desired results. So weight loss can be tough. And this is why 
because uh, people go for the generic approach and we have been saying this again and again to emphasize that not one size fits all. So people respond differently to dif the same weight loss program. There is a lot of inter individual variability which highlights the need for more personalized approaches to weight loss and genetic influence. It's not like that uh, only with, prop with diet and exercise uh, you can achieve weight loss. You have to understand the genetic underpinnings of your weight that is very unique to you because you have been uniquely uh, wired your body your genes have been uniquely wired that is uh, applicable to only you so if your genetic tendencies are unique then your weight loss strategy is also uh, it, it needs to be unique so that is suitable only for you that is meant for you so that you can achieve the desired results now the question is whether a low carb diet or a gluten free or a high protein, high fiber, low fat or Mediterranean diet, which diet is actually okay for me, which is suitable for me. Some people may respond well uh, for a high carb diet. Some people may respond well to a low fat diet or high protein, but not everyone will respond to every diet. So which is the ideal diet for you? You can come to know through uh, genetic testing and genetic test report will highlight for you that what is your tendency for macronutrient metabolism, whether you have a weight gain tendency with carbs and fats, whether you have a weight loss tendency with proteins and fibers, and how efficiently the micronutrients will be metabolized in your body so that we can predict that whether you have a high tendency for certain nutrients like vitamin D or vitamin B12, which minerals or calcium or iron for which uh, minerals or vitamins your you have a genetic predisposition for this thing and again then uh, genetic tests can also report on your tendency for satiety whether you have low satiety or high satiety whether you have a tendency for emotional eating or snacking what could be your taste preference genetically inherently when you know what's there inside you can listen to the story of your genes and accordingly design a plan that works best for you. So actually genetic tests can solve this mystery that what is the right diet for me? It may be different for you, it may be different for me. So we need to understand what is the best one for me. So if I give you a slight insight from our data, uh, you see that nearly, uh, nearly uh, one quarter of individuals like 20 to 22 percent of individuals in our cohort they had very high risk for obesity and uh, similarly when you look at the pmi level uh, people had like nearly 50 percent of people they had a uh, moderate risk for obesity certain individuals they like generally it is believed that uh, High protein diet is always going to lead to weight loss. But if you see in our cohort, it was predicted from their genetic uh, test that nearly half of the individuals are not going to respond to a high protein diet in terms of weight loss. A high protein diet may have other health benefits, but for those particular individuals who are harboring that genetic variation, a high protein diet is not going to be effective in terms of weight loss. Similarly, nearly 47% of females and 46% of males, uh, they will have no weight loss with high fiber diet. Now, what happens is if you look at the, there is again a very popular notion that if you exercise and if you go for high levels of physical activity, it guarantees weight loss, but that is not true for everyone because if you see what our data shows and similar data has been reported in other parts of the world also that not everyone will have a same tendency of weight loss with exercise. So in nearly 34 to 36% of individuals in our cohort, they had no weight loss tendency with exercise. This means that for uh, weight loss, they have to rely on a combination of um, dietary interventions they have to focus more on the dietary interventions rather than the physical activity or it has to be a combination of both in order to achieve desired weight loss results i mean someone is just 
go going for different uh, forms of exercise for weight loss but they are not achieving the desired result is because their genetic tendency is not for weight loss with exercise so they are not able to figure out that i am doing everything that is required that has been told by my trainer by my dietitian by my nutrition coach but i am not able to see because uh, when we look into the nutrient component for example here so i need to see whether my body is conditioned in such a way that i have a high weight loss tendency with a protein diet or a fiber diet or a combination of both will be essential and if suppose if i do not have a weight loss tendency with high protein diet and i i keep on eating that protein it is not going to create any change in my weight so accordingly by knowing that what is good or bad for me i can design my food food plate i can choose my food so that it can give me more effective results so one such test on predictive genomics is offered from our company so we are offering a, a test which is reporting on 80 parameters as i say that it is not a wise approach to target one one gene at a time or one disease at a time or one trait at a time when you can club it all together and have a more holistic approach so we are giving you uh, your risk and genetic tendencies for 80 different parameters in four different categories that is health nutrition fitness and habits under the health section uh, we talk about the genetic risk is calculated for 33 different parameters and under uh, endocrine and metabolic disorders you see that obesity is also covered along with other uh, predisposing factors like hypothyroidism or type 2 diabetes that may also contribute to weight gain under the nutrition section with talk there is an one entire sub section that is focusing on diet and weight this means that what is your tendency for having a higher bmi whether you have a weight gain tendency with carbohydrate or saturated fat and many of the times there is a clear notion that mono unsaturated fats they are healthy fats they are indeed healthy fats they are good for your heart and brain health but one very ignored fact is that eventually it is fat and it is calorie dense and it can contribute to weight gain okay so not all individuals have the same tendency to gain weight with mono unsaturated and polyunsaturated fat now you need to check whether you are among those few individuals who have a weight gain tendency with mufa and pufa that is mono and polyunsaturated fats because what happens is maybe your mufa and pufa intake your nuts and seeds are way higher than it's required by your body and which is why it is contributing to weight gain rather than your carbs your mufa and pufa are contributing more to your weight gain but you are focusing on reducing your carbs and it is not going to help because your weight gain is coming from mufa and pufa and you are not reducing it you are working on reducing the carbs going lower and lower on carbs but it is actually not contributing so this is how there are changes at individual level that needs to be understood and accordingly action is to be taken now when you come to uh, fitness we report on 13 parameters and there is one parameter called as weight loss with exercise so what is your tendency whether you are going to have a moderate decrease in weight or no decrease in weight at all with exercise or you have a good tendency accordingly there is also a parameter about endurance and aerobic capacity and power based exercises so this will highlight that actually which exercise is suitable whether you are are going to perform well in endurance based exercise or a power based exercise accordingly you can tweak your uh, gym profile your fitness profile and focus on something that you are more designed for more wired for so this is how a genetic testing can help you and the process is very simple from the comfort of your home you can actually give a blood or saliva sample and it will come to us we will extract your dna we will genotype you and based on the knowledge base what is your genotype and accordingly what should be the interpretation we give a report to you in a pdf format or a mobile app format or api integration can be done for hospitals right rack so they can use this information and the doctors and the trainers and the coaches can actually guide 
so our reports are very easy to understand very comprehensive as well as in a very uh, simple language and we also give the reports in a app format as well so just one small st uh, case study we would like to share for our one of our clients she was a obese female and she had this problem of pcos and history for certain conditions like to type type 2 diabetes and colon cancer and when we did uh, her dietary recall we found that she feels low satiety so th this means that she had a tendency of uh, overeating and she was following this intermittent fasting but she was not observing any significant weight loss and exercise wise also she was doing uh, um, a moderate amount of uh, work but she was not able to achieve weight loss so when we did her genetic test we found that she has she had an increased risk for obesity at the genetic level increased risk for hypothyroidism and PCOS all together contributing to weight gain and under the nutrition section we found that she has an increased weight gain tendency with saturated fats but she had a weight loss tendency with high fiber diet and high protein diet and uh, she was likely to perform better in power based exercise and endurance based this means that she was doing only endurance based exercises earlier but her genetic test results showed that there is indeed a benefit for weight loss with exercise and if she combines both uh, endurance and power based which means if she will include more of strength training also it can help her weight uh, weight loss and if we if she includes a uh, high fiber or more of fruits and vegetables in her diet it will help her improve her weight so as you can see that before taking the genetic test in the current diet she was taking very less carbs and 30 percent of uh, proteins and 30 percent of fats so the genetic counselor when she studied her reports the her genetic test reports as well as her current lifestyle she came to a conclusion that she needs to Im improve or increase her carbs content but here the carbs will comprise more of the fiber containing carbs because she has a weight loss tendency with carbs. So she included uh, more of whole grains, fruits and non-starchy vegetables, which can help both with her PCOS, insulin sensitivity and losing her weight also. And for the proteins, she kept the proportion same 30% because she has a weight loss tendency with protein as well. So that can protein can help her feel more satiable and it can also help her lose weight but she told the client that she has to be very uh, observant about where she is sourcing her protein from because it has to come from sources which are not uh, which are lean sources of protein which are high in protein but not high in other uh, saturated fats or so so that it will not contribute to further weight gain she was told to reduce her uh, fats, uh, especially the trans fats and saturated fats. And with portion control and reduced calorie intake and uh, regular physical activity, because strength training, what she was not doing earlier, that was also added to her uh, diet program. And for PCOS management, also the counselor, it provided a nutrigenomic plan. So based on that, she uh, could improve her HbA1c levels, better manage her PCOS conditions. And uh, if you see that within a six months, she was able to reduce 13 kgs. And uh, what modifications was done, that more intake of fiber and protein coupled with a more tailored exercise, it resulted in this improvement. So this is just one example that how genetic testing can help. So if we see the take home messages, I will conclude that obesity is indeed a global crisis that already touches everyone in one manner or other. And this realization should be a call to action like the one which do, uh, the doctors and the center, RAC center is doing because there is a good news that obesity is preventable and reversible as well. And when weight loss programs are guided by genetic test results, it result in a more personalized approach to weight loss that aligns with one's unique genetic makeup and yields more effective results. Knowledge of predisposition to obesity and other nutritional tendencies can take can help you take more informed decisions so that you can achieve overall health and optimal weight. Thank you so much. I conclude my presentation with these messages and uh, over to you, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you.
Hello. Dr. Nekha, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. <clears throat> that was fascinating. Thank I'm absolutely delighted with your statement, and I completely agree with you that Rag Hospital is to be commended for its forward-looking direction. Not only are we looking at weight loss uh, and passing on the information uh, that we have, but we're also moving in completely new areas of endeavor. And to that extent, this presentation today was remarkable. Well done. It was remarkable. Thank you. It showed us how individualized the human body is and the human individual is, and how with minor tweaking, we can achieve greater results. Yes. A little small examples, which come within my area of, uh, of, of better understanding, is the modification of uh, high intensity weight exercises as opposed to cardiovascular exercises, where one where buildup of muscle uh, tends to help you to lose more, uh, more fat and weight and use greater energy. That is an excellent thought. The other one is uh, the reversal of, or the understanding of reduction in fat utilization or increase in fiber utilization. I mean, while we know these things in general, to be able to specify that this is relevant to you is remarkable, is remarkable. And I want to thank you and Indus Health for moving forward with this. And I'm indeed delighted that Rack Hospital will perhaps be your partner in working in this area. Thank you so much for this specificity. Thank you so much. Uh, as always, there is much I learn from these webinars and me and all the rest of us who listen in are grateful for this. I'm going to leave this now with Dr. Wilku to frame a few questions for you to answer, Dr. Nika. Yes. Dr. Wilku, sir. Uh, yes, thank you, Professor. First of all, thank you to Dr. Nika Khan. Wonderful presentation, all insights. Many of the people, many of the participants, many of the patients, even us, will be lacking that why we are not able to lose weight. This is what we should know about it. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Doc, I have been receiving messages, but I don't know why people are shy to put in the chat box. I don't know. Oh, one sec. There is one question. There. One second, please. Okay, no, that's not a question. Okay, I will take nine questions uh, which I received in my WhatsApp. Uh, first question, as general, uh, this is what I stated just now. One of my patients, my own patients, his BMI is 31.5. His whole family is obese, but quite good obese. Oh, all are 32, 33 in, in between this uh, BMI. As you suggested, can lifestyle modification change the genetic factor? Doc. So, so can I answer? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So, Dr. Vilku, uh, thank you for the question. So, as you say that the in, there is a very strong family history. So, first we have to rule out whether it is because of the monogenic form or some high penetrant mutations. So for that, a separate testing, separate kind of genetic test can be done, okay? And if there is some monogenic form of obesity, it has to be tackled. Uh, it cannot be tackled with only dietary interventions. The strategy will change based on the, the form of the genetic obesity. So for monogenic forms of obesity, the approach is going to be different. So if there is a very strong family history, I suspect that maybe there is some monogenic form or some syndromic form of obesity that is running in the family. We have to first uh, do that syndromic diagnosis and then accordingly suggest. So dietary modifications can bring out some changes, but if it is monogenic, some other medications and other interventions may also be required. So now when we talk about this entire family is obese, 
we also have to consider one more important factor that there is a shared environmental aspect also the shared diet and environment where they are living so if there is no genetic component as such but all of them are feeding on uh, nutrient dense or calorie dense foods the lifestyle is also shared between the family members so that may also be a contributing factor so we have to first pinpoint whether it is because of the monogenic forms or the polygenic causes or it is entirely uh, what do you say lifestyle based accordingly the approach can be different yeah uh, uh, not, uh, there, there is there is one new medicine munjaro uh, the lapteris now people uh, fda has uh, approved it uh, as a good medicine for weight loss generally uh, it was uh, presented for a diabetic management and uncontrolled diabetes management so do you uh, suggest any medications uh, i'm not saying it's an open prescription i'm just saying is there any medication i will just twist it out is there any medication which can uh, alter the genetic uh, factor in the obesity so it cannot actually alter but it can work on certain pathways in the body that can counter the effect of that genetic oh. variation so it cannot alter that particular genetic variation but it can alter the effect produced by that particular genetic variation it can counter the effect so when we talk about the medications also um, dr will food the thing is that there is a concept called as pharmacogenomics so not all drugs are suitable to everyone it is also because the drug has to get metabolized in the body okay so now depending upon that per that particular person may have certain genetic variations that can hinder the metabolism of that particular drug based on which it is not suitable for that particular individual and either it will be ineffective or it may produce certain undesirable side effects so for certain drugs uh, that i know for obesity there are certain test also available that will define whether this drug will be suitable for this individual or not so for this new drug i need to check that whether any such genetic variants have been associated and uh, maybe we can discuss it further after i go through this uh, literature that whether there are any genetic variants associated with the metabolism of this drug because not necessarily all individuals will give an effect to this particular drug that also is regulated at the genetic level and that is a separate concept in itself which is called as pharmacogenomics yeah 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 basically these are leptin and renalin inhibitors so that was on that okay the first question which i was talking about my uh, patient now he has uh, asked me another question um, they are newly uh, married couple a uh, year back they are planning for a child and he is concerned about the obesity as uh, their family history what he is asking is there any uh, facility or any feature that we can modify the genes before uh, like a uh, ivf uh the thing is that unless we understand in the parents itself that what carriers they are like whether they are harboring any genetic variation or mutation so first we need to check in the parents and then if there are certain genes for which are modifiable because not every gene is modifiable gene therapy is not available for every each and every gene or genetic variant so first we need to understand what is it that is contributing to weight gain in the parents and if it is it if it can at all be addressed through gene therapy then we can think on those lines because that is a very next level step so maybe uh, we need to first work on the parents establish the basis of obesity in them and then think about the next generation that is the progeny so this yeah. is how should be done okay so now my uh, from my side i will be because he was talking about the predictive uh, genomic testing and nutrigenic testing also so you mentioned that uh, like you now also you are uh, saying many of the genes can be modified whether it is by uh, lifestyle whether it is by uh, medication or whatever so lifestyle if uh, the gene can be completely reversed or it can uh, be reduced the effect of uh, bad effect can be reduced by lifestyle yes the 
the gene cannot be changed the gene genetic variant cannot be reversed for most of the gene genes for some gene therapies available but that is for few but most of genes you cannot change but the effect produced because of that genetic variation can be reversed as dr kennedy was also addressing in his welcome address that through epigenetic because what we eat also has a lot of effect on the gene expression so if there are certain food which is changing the way that the gene is expressed you can mitigate that risk by reducing the effect of that genetic variation lifestyle modification is actually the way forward it is actually very important and it has effects so it can yeah. have substantially uh, good results yeah thank you so much and uh, connected to the same question like epigenetics you were talking about the lifestyle and external factors which influence the genes uh, the nutrigenic uh, testing you are talking about so uh, you uh, placed one uh, example of the client also my question is if there is any uh, detection that a particular food item whether it is a carb whether it is a fiber whether it is a fufa mufa protein whatever or some uh, idiosyncratic uh, syndromicity is also there so is it possible that we can uh, modify or i might uh, i'll elaborate my question is it possible to completely cure that or it can be controlled by modification what is suggested by the nutrigenic testing okay so it can be reversed but then after reversal after achieving weight loss you have to maintain it to prevent weight regain so that's why it is important that you uh, design a particular approach and then stick by it so it it is not it it cannot be cured as such because the genetic variant will remain in its place it cannot be cured but obesity can be reversed weight loss can be achieved then you have to stick by that plan to maintain that particular weight it's not yeah. that once you have reversed it then you can go back to your normal lifestyle as you were doing earlier and it will remain at that particular state no if you go back to that lifestyle if you start like if you have achieved weight loss with a particular intervention and then you go back to your old lifestyle obviously it will not remain in that position the weight will again come back the regain will yeah. be there uh why i was asking this question because uh, recently not recently a uh, two years back we were studying about reversal of diabetes by lifestyle medicine uh i'm fortunate to be part of american college of lifestyle medicine so in there uh the patient the control subjects were taken in the, in the study and they were completely on a standard protocol which helps to uh, reverse it and most of them most of, around 55% of them was completely reversed and they didn't get uh, diabetes uh, after that next 45% 45% people were there uh, out of uh, which some of them were reduced but they were very prone immediately if they slightly change their uh, lifestyle like what you are saying immediately they jump back to the uh, same position so there is a tendency and uh, that the reason i was asking this question my last question is there any connection between uh, blood group dieting and genetics blood group blood group diet there was uh, one uh, format uh, 10 years back blood, blood group, group diet yeah yeah blood group so, diet and uh, genetics is there any connection so there have been some association studies but the association is not very strong and further replication studies is to be done to confirm this association so as yet it's not like it is full proof and there is a very direct strong connection some associations are coming up but it needs to be replicated in multiple populations because when we talk about gene and uh, uh, what do you say gene and parameter association always and always you cannot base it uh on one particular uh population it has to be replicated or one study if you are getting an association in only one study with small sample size you cannot conclude anything based on that for a association to be considered significant it has to be done on a large cohort size and 
it has to be replicated across population and different ethnicities. Then you can say that indeed yeah. there is an association. So some results are there, but this needs to be replicated further in other population and more studies are warranted for this. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Nikit. It was wonderful presentation and your answers were uh, very straightforward so that uh, people are understanding. Now I think the participant will be having curiosity uh, why we are not uh, reducing our weight and what should we do? The next step is uh, Ed. Uh, thank you very much. Professor, over to you. Of course, Dr. Wilku, the questions can go on forever. A completely new subject and very, very enlightening. Uh, you know, my understanding during this webinar leads me to believe that the great benefit of Indus Health and genetic testing is that it results in many of us not having the excuse of saying it's because of my genes. Many of us say I am overweight because it is genetically so. It is in my genes. The good news with the Indus Health Association and Rack Hospital and these studies worldwide is that genetic testing helps you to precisely identify a problem and to give you a precise solution. But the solutions nevertheless have to be lifestyle oriented. That does not change. Or it will be medical or surgically oriented. That does not change. But what does change is the profound knowledge that when you do genetic testing, you know the exact reason, which until now we were not able to precisely identify. It's definitely a step in the right direction. And that, Dr. Nekat, I must thank you very much for a very, a very enlightening and a very confident and a very technically simple, well-presented uh, explanation. You have greatly added to our knowledge. Thank you so much, Dr. Nikat. And we seriously look at a strong ongoing association with your organization, with you in particular, and with genetics and our lifestyle uh, and our weight loss challenge. Thank you so much. I want to thank my audience uh, for their continued participation in this program. This video, the same as all our other videos, will remain on site and you can view it anytime you wish. It is profound knowledge that is available to you. I want to talk, I want to thank Dr. Wilku, who was at his best today, asking many questions uh, and dueling in many ways with Dr. Nikat about whether genes can be reversed or genes can be modified. And I understood simply from there that the gene expression can be modified, but the gene does not change. And of course, I'm grateful for that. that but that is very, very enlightenedly put. Well done, well done, well done. And of course, I've thanked my audience, I've thanked Dr. Wilku, and I've thanked the speaker. I cannot forget to thank all the workers behind the scene who we cannot see. Uh, Arabian Wellness, my team out there, I am speaking to you from India. Uh, Dr. Nikat is speaking to you from India. Dr. Wilku is speaking to you from the UAE. My entire team is sitting out there in the UAE uh, coordinating this program. Uh, on the one hand, Rack Hospital is making available its facilities. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Wilku and uh, Dr. Kennedy. And thank you, Rack Hospital, for facilitating this kind of platform and giving us an opportunity because we share the same interest and same idea that with awareness, we can actually make change and we can uh, motivate people to adopt a healthy lifestyle and to combat diseases like obesity and other multiple other diseases, which is actually preventable. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to working together 
uh, in this noble cause of yours to give a healthy weight to multiple people and changing thank you. life of people. Thank you so much. Thank and you, thank you thank all you. on behalf of the entire Indus family. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Goodbye.